how to fall asleep easily, and how to make sure that the sleep we have is of sufficient duration and quality. Now, what if you wake up in the middle of the night? This is a very common occurrence. And there are two general themes around waking up in the middle of the night that one can use tools to counteract. The first theme is if you're somebody who is tired in the evenings and you're kind of pushing yourself to stay awake. So you're going to the party or you're pushing yourself to study your work when in fact you'd like to get into bed at 8.30 or 9 and then you're falling asleep around 10.30 or 11 and waking up at 2.30 or 3 in the morning and you can't fall back asleep. Chances are that your melatonin pulse was initiated early in the night so that a melatonin pulse started probably around 8.30 or 9, but you're staying up. You're battling that melatonin. And then sometime around 2.30 or 3 in the morning, that melatonin is no longer present at sufficiently high levels in your bloodstream, and you're waking up. You're getting your morning cortisol pulse shifted into those wee hours of the morning. You may not like this advice, but one of the things that you can do to offset that is to simply go to bed earlier. By going to bed earlier, you're going to get the longer duration of sleep. But I realize that there are social reasons and work-related reasons why going to bed at 8.30 or 9 is not necessarily beneficial to your life. So in that case, you might be one of the rare individuals for whom getting a little bit more bright light in the evening could be a good thing. So this would be around the hours of 7 or 8 p.m. And in that way, causing that pulse in melatonin to be delayed because again, light inhibits melatonin. Now, the other thing is many people wake up in the middle of the night because of anxiety or because they have to use the restroom. It's perfectly fine to flip on the lights, but keep the lights dim. But if you flip on those lights, try and flip them off as soon as possible and try and get back into bed. And if you have trouble falling asleep again and you absolutely need to sleep, that's where these NSDR, these non-sleep deep rest protocols can really be beneficial. Even though the, um, the NS, the non-sleep part, might make you think that uh, they will prevent you from falling asleep, rather than trying to fight your mind, trying to fight anxiety, which is always a terrible thing to do. I always say it's very hard to control the mind with the mind. Look to the body, and that's what NSDR scripts do. Things like Yoga Nidra, even the uh, sleep hypnosis done in the middle of the night if you wake up and want to fall back asleep oftentimes will help you fall back asleep immediately and if they don't they will at least put your brain and body into a state of deep relaxation that more closely mimics the sleep state that you ought to be in than the awake ruminating stressing about the fact that you're not sleeping state so if you wake up in the middle of the night really try and get back to sleep and if you can't do that by doing for instance long exhale breathing which can work use some other tool of the body to shift the mind and the tools that i'm recommending are of the non-sleep deep rest variety if you happen to stay up late it's still best to get up at your regular wake up time it's a very simple solution to a problem that a lot of people have which is they stay up till two or three in the morning and then they tend to sleep late and then it tends to disrupt their rhythm try on most days and most nights to wake up at more or less the same time and try to go to sleep at more or less the same time If you get a poor night's sleep, or if you're up late the previous night for good reasons, many people feel like they just want to go to bed early the next night, but it turns out that's not the best thing to do for your immediate and long-term health. Try and stay up to the point where you would normally stay up and then get to sleep. If you go to bed a couple hours earlier, it's probably not going to kill you, but try to not go to bed, for instance, at 6 p.m. because you were up the entire night before. That can really be disruptive how to fall asleep easily, and how to make sure that the sleep we have is of sufficient duration and quality. One way to do that is to leverage the drop in temperature that's necessary to fall and stay asleep. So as I mentioned earlier, in the early parts of the day after waking, our body temperature is rising, and that continues throughout the day. And then sometime late in the afternoon, our temperature peaks, and then it starts to drop. That drop in temperature of one to three degrees is vitally important for us to be able to fall asleep easily. One way that we can decrease our transition time into sleep is to accelerate that drop in temperature. And one way to accelerate that drop in temperature, somewhat counterintuitively, is to use hot baths, hot showers, or if you have access to one, a sauna. If you are to get into a sauna or a hot shower or a hot bath and then get out, 
your body is going to engage particular mechanisms for cooling itself off that are going to allow you to drop your temperature more quickly and fall asleep more easily. And this is why many people find that falling asleep after a nice hot shower, bath, or sauna is really, really easy and really terrific. It's sort of a natural state that follows hot baths, saunas, and showers. You will experience a growth hormone release from sauna, hot bath, and hot shower, provided they're done for sufficient duration and sufficiently high temperature. It is absolutely true that keeping the room very dark is beneficial. Some people, including myself, have thin eyelids, and it doesn't take much light to wake up the brain and body. So keeping a room very dark is essential. The other thing is keeping the room cool. You've probably heard this before. Keep the room cool, get under warm blankets, but rarely is it discussed why keeping the room cool is useful. The reason keeping the room cool is useful for getting into and staying asleep is that throughout the night, there are phases of sleep where you are paralyzed, so-called REM sleep. That's a healthy paralysis, so you can, presumably so you can't act out your dreams. But there are portions of the night where you can move. And one of the more important movements that you do in the middle... the night is put your hand out or your foot out or you take your face out from under the covers as a means to cool yourself and you do this while you are asleep if you are in a cool room you can put yourself under the blankets to stay warm and then if you want to cool off you can simply remove a limb or you can toss the covers off entirely however if you are in a room that's too warm it's very hard to cool off you would need a bucket of ice water or to get up and turn on the air conditioning or something of that sort or turn on the fan. So it's a simple but non-trivial way in which we can improve our entrance to sleep and staying asleep. So keep the room cool or cold and get under warm blankets. I do enjoy food very, very much. And so my dinner is carbohydrates and some protein. So maybe some chicken or fish or something like that, maybe some eggs, or sometimes just pasta or just rice and vegetables. And that's because I enjoy those foods, but also because I want to increase the amount of serotonin in my brain so that I can actually fall asleep that night. Many people who are on low carbohydrate diets struggle with falling and staying asleep. And that's because it's hard to achieve heightened levels of serotonin, which are necessary to enter sleep. I should also mention that melatonin and serotonin fall in the same pathway. They are related uh, hormones and neuromodulators. We won't go into their biosynthesis now, but essentially what we're talking about is a system that's biasing us towards rest and relaxation as opposed to wakefulness. You might ask, well, can't I just take serotonin? Can't I just take 5-HTP or a precursor to serotonin or tryptophan? And indeed you can. However, many people, including myself, find that when they supplement with serotonin in the evening or at night, that can cause problems in the architecture or the structure of sleep. It can cause a lot of people, including me, to fall asleep very fast, sleep very deeply for three or four hours, and then wake up and have a terrible time falling back asleep. And that effect, at least for me, is... Uh,
last several days. It's really disruptive. So I don't like to supplement with anything that is directly dopamine or a precursor to dopamine at any time or directly serotonin or a precursor to serotonin. Rather, there are other things that can enhance the transition to sleep safely. But the evening meal consists largely of carbohydrates for that specific purpose of generating a sense of calm. And of course, carbohydrates are delicious. And because I'm doing some physical training, and presumably you are as well, or I hope you are, because it's so beneficial to one's health. That's also going to replenish my glycogen stores, which is the one of the primary fuel sources for moving one's muscles and moving around and doing exercise, as well as for the brain and for cognitive function. So low carbohydrates uh, throughout the 24-hour period are not something that are attractive to me. I realize that some people will do much better on a low-carbohydrate or even ketogenic diet, but... Um, for me, and I do believe for most people, creating a situation of maybe fasting and then low carb or no carb diets for states of alertness and focus at one portion of the day and then ingesting starchy carbohydrates for sake of inducing rest and relaxation is a at least scientifically rationally based protocol. It's grounded in real neurochemistry. It's grounded in things that we can point to and say, ah, this food substance, this thing can support my brain, not directly because it's some magic substance that's going to make all my neurons, uh, you know, extremely robust, but rather it's going to support sleep, which is perhaps the foundation of all mental and physical health. In fact, we can point to sleep as the primary way in which we can ensure our overall health, including our brain health.